session. So today's session is hosted by the American Society of Engineering Education's Commission of DEI, but I would like to also acknowledge our impact partners, our ASC Management for DEI Committee, um, our ASWE's Engineering Management Division, and ASWE's Engineering Development Division, each who have had help in, in our recruitment efforts. In today's session, we reached over 200 individual registered individuals, and we have 89 people with us today. So thank you again for all of our help as an impact partner in facilitating the, um, the logistics of helping us get the word out. But today's speaker is ready to go. So I would like to introduce to you today, Dr. Megan Pop. Pollock. Um, she began her career playing with the light projection on tiny microscopic mirrors as an engineer for tech TI instruments. Um, through her company, Engineering Inclusion, she now utilizes metamorphic projections and mirrors to shine a light on micro and macro social systems that, when adjusted, improve students and employee success in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A TED speaker, author, and a past recipient of the National Science Foundation's Graduate Research Fellowship, Megan holds a PhD in engineering education from Purdue University, a master's in science in electrical engineering from Texas Tech University, and a bachelor's in computer science from Texas Women University. As an engineer, she turned educator, and Megan focuses on helping others intentionally as she engineers inclusion in education and in the workforce. So with that, I would like to turn it over to today's speaker, Dr. Megan Pollitt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. All right, I think I got my screen shared. You're seeing the blue screen, yeah? All right, welcome everyone. I am so thrilled that you chose to be here today. We have a pretty large audience and we had over 200 people register. And so for that, how we're gonna do um, our session today is we are gonna have lots of interaction and then we're gonna save the breakout discussion for the very end um, so that we'll be able to allow people to participate um, in a way that they can. And then for those who can stay on and hang on for discussion, you'll be able to dive into the end. Now, um, again, this is based on initially the TEDx talk that I delivered a year ago in Chicago. You can check that out and listen to it if you want. It's 11 minutes and I have a discussion guide if you wanna show that to your team. Uh, and so all of the resources that I'm gonna share today are in the chat. So um, the link 70v.co slash leader, everything I'm gonna share is gonna be there. Um, but I do want to, you know, again, thank everyone for coming today. Um, this is important to me for on a variety of reasons. One, I love the topic, but the Commission for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is a for ASWE is something that I've committed a lot of time to for the last four years. Um, so the, I've served as the director of professional development, um, and we started these awesome workshops in the initial stages of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and it really set a great opportunity for us to continue to, to provide professional learning for others. Um, I am now serving as the incoming chair for the commission. And so again, I just wanna thank our partners for the American Society for Engineering Management. Um, so again, we see uh, we've got some Woodrow here, helped us connect there um, to Meg Hanley for helping us to connect with the, the lead division for ASWE and all of our people who helped to, to expand our reach for this. Thank you for that, I really appreciate it. Um, so again, to help us, um, you know, we've got the live transcript going. If that bothers you, you can hide it. If you want to share your camera, I'd love to see you. Um, that would be awesome. You're welcome to share. It doesn't have to be just me sharing a camera. Um, you've got the ability to use the reactions, so use those liberally. Um, this is a really good point to sort of check and make sure that your name shows up how you want to be called. Um, sometimes we log in on somebody else's account. Um, it doesn't show up how you want. So just make sure that you are who you want to be today. Um, and I also invite you to add your pronouns. And to that point, my pronouns are she or they. Um, and I, you know, if you want to learn more about that, I've got some great resource, resources on my website to talk about why we share our pronouns. So some guiding questions for us today and, and objectives. We're gonna start with uh, helping us think about to ourselves, what is an inclusive leader? And you're gonna have an opportunity to reflect on what does inclusive leadership mean for you? 
Um, then we're going to talk about how does one become an inclusive leader? And I'm really intentional about that language become because there is never a terminal point in which you have achieved um, inclusive leadership 100%. We are always becoming and we are always learning and growing. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to explore a four part iterative process. Um, you're going to be able to assess and make a plan and adapt your own leadership skills and practices to become a more inclusive leader. And you're going to leave with more strategies and resources than you know what to do with, but I've got a plan to help you figure out how to get started with those strategies so it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Uh, so again, thanks, Ali, for helping us to share those links. Um, I have a PDF handout that you can access here. It's going to have a summary of everything that we're going to go through today. And so I encourage you to, to download that. It's not necessary for what we're doing today, but it will help you to, to kind of keep us moving. And then also the website here. Um, the, this has lots of important resources that I'm going to share today, so you can always come back and download the PDF if you forget to save it today. If you like slides, I'm sharing my slides with you so you can access those here. And then here's an action plan and some suggested strategies for how you can approach this. And so as we go throughout the time today, I'm going to add a bunch of links in the chat as I'm talking, but everything I'm sharing, I'm pretty sure is already on this page, but it's just an opportunity to kind of point you to the direction of all of the resources that I'm going to be sharing. So again, you can access this now. We'll keep putting the link in the chat. And again, the handout looks like this. And so um, now, Christina already did a little bit of a sort of warm up to help us think about how we want to show up today. But one of the tools that I created um, earlier this year was on group norms and like how do we set a sort of intentional session pledge for how we want to operate. And so the, the sort of why we do this is because every group naturally develop some like normative behaviors, expectations, and some unwritten ways of operating. And so to intentionally engineer inclusion, we can set or establish norms that scaffold equitable and inclusive practices. And so that's one of the things that I want to share with you today are lots of tools that help you employ the things that we're talking about, right? We need tools that help us to change our behavior. And this is one way that you can do this. And so if you go to that domain, uh, the session pledge, then you'll be able to access lots of different resources that you can employ in the classroom or in your in your staff meetings. Um, I even have some sample slides that you can use. And so there's a PDF that you can access and to learn more about this. But the key thing that we want to focus on today is make sure that we're staying engaged, sharing the mic, supporting others, and get ready to stretch and reflect as we go throughout. Um, so this first Slido poll, if you've never used Slido, this works best if you have a smartphone and so you I think we're all maybe used to using QR codes thanks to COVID, but um, open the camera, the photo, hover it over the QR code, wait till the little bubble pops up, open that up. And once you use that QR code, that's the same QR code that we're going to use throughout the whole workshop. And so this is a little bit of a warm up to give you a chance to sort of tune in and why I like this is because it allows you to sort of be part of the live conversation. It puts it all on one screen so you're not having to check back and forth with the chat um, and so it kind of brings us all into the present space here. Uh, you can see here it tells us that um, about 20 people are typing um, and so and then what will tell us here in the top right how many people have contributed once those go live. And so um, tell us your name, your role, and what do you hope to get out of today's session? Now, if you can't figure out how to work the QR code and the slides, you can open it up in your browser. And if you're still having some, some issues, go for the chat. I'm still, I still have this chat here open and we've got hand, a handful of people helping us to monitor that as well. So tell us your name, your role, and what do you hope to get out of today's session? All right, Dale, yeah, thank you for timing in. You want to learn some innovative inclusion practices. You song, learn to be an inclusive leader. Sandra, welcome. Joshua, Meg, awesome. And so you'll be able to, on your device, continue to kind of scroll up and see these things. And then these are going to be saved afterwards as well. So many great contributions. Thank you. I'm going to read through these. Want to improve leadership skills opportunity to reflect and goal set. Hey, we've got lots of opportunities for goal setting today. So I'm glad that you came for that. 
um, some learn about some more inclusive practices, add to your leadership toolkit. Awesome. Looking to improve your skills. Actions to implement and shift STEM culture. Inclusion practices while supporting faculty in your department. Improve leadership of a diverse team, fostering inclusive environment. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for contributing to this. This is a good sort of warm up to get you ready to use this tool. And we're gonna dive in. If you don't get to, con to contribute to this, that's okay. Um, you can add it to the chat, but we're gonna, I'm gonna move us forward. So again, thank you all for participating. So to get our conversation started, I want you to think about what is an inclusive leader? What are those traits, qualities, and behaviors of inclusive leadership? Now we're going to go jump right back into a Slido poll, and I want you to just get all those neurons firing, thinking about what's an inclusive leader? What does it mean to you? What are those traits and the qualities and the behaviors of inclusive leadership? So they're thoughtful. What else? They're understanding. They listen, they're not biased. They're reflective, they ask for feedback, they're empathetic. Listener, they're welcoming, they have integrity, they're authentic, respectful of everyone, um, non-judgmental. They're intentional in their approach. Lots of uh, notes here about listening, being respectful, being collaborative, being empathetic, being intentional, um, a high emotional intelligence. Lots of comments here around feedback, so being open to feedback and being good at giving feedback. Um, let's see, welcoming, open-minded listener, intentional, empathetic, understanding. So we definitely have some commonalities here that you all are voting on. Thank you. All right, we're going to dive forward here. Now, when we look at what inclusive leadership is, it is a set of behaviors. It's a set of behaviors that focus on group members feeling part of the group, retaining their sense of individuality while contributing to group processes and outcomes. Now, I want you to think about what does it feel like? What does it feel like to belong while being your authentic self and being a valuable member of a team? What does that feel like? What does it feel like to belong while being your authentic self and being a valuable part of that team. What does that feel like? Feels good, feels good, right? You feel safe, empowered, comfortable. You have a freedom, you feel validated, it's rewarding, it feels fantastic. Um, you feel heard, you feel safe and secure, safe, validated, productive. Yeah, so there is an influence of how you feel based on what you can get done, right? Um, it's satisfying. You feel accepted and secure. Lots of commonalities here. Excellent. Yeah, so when we when we experience inclusive leadership, when we experience environments that help us to feel like we belong, where we can show up as our authentic selves and we feel like a valued part of the team, these are all things that we want, right? And we feel valued, validated and valued. Excellent. So to help us kind of move forward, um, if you feel like maybe you sort of always feel like you belong, right? You know, maybe you feel like you have, of course, you belong everywhere, right? Um, or maybe you've never thought about how other people belong. I want to share this quote from a colleague, a friend of mine. He's he is an engineer. He worked in the oil and gas industry, and um, he emailed me this after watching my TED talk, and I want to read it to you. He said, I worked in a male dominated engineering industry, oil and gas. We had female engineers all the way back to the 80s. We had female engineers. I never saw them treated differently, but I never thought about how they might feel in that environment. And to me, this is a really powerful takeaway. How do people feel and how are we thinking about the ways in which other people feel in an environment? And so when we think about diversity, we know that culture and diversity are not always visible, right? We can look at each other and we can say, hey, we all sort of maybe look the same or we all share this one thing in common. But there are so many dimensions of diversity and this list is by no means comprehensive. But there are so many parts of our identity that are beneath 
the the water line right they're beneath the things that we can see we can't always see what people experience and that can be both their race their gender their socioeconomic status it could be their trauma that they've lived through it could be their family and and all of the things that they sort of bring we may not be able to see that and so when we think about belonging there are two two kinds of belonging i want us to make sure that we sort of split apart here so first is this forced belonging raise your hand if you've ever said i belong gosh darn it no matter what i'm gonna fit in i'm gonna do everything i can to make it work how many of you have ever like set that intention right yes many of us right we have that intention of like i'm gonna belong i'm gonna adjust i'm gonna adapt i'm gonna and maybe unintentionally have to assimilate to a culture that's not your own but what happens here is we begin to feel like the sort of square peg round hole and our effort to jam ourselves and to fit into an environment we end up losing part of ourselves right we're shaving off the sort of edges of ourselves we're we're morphing in to fit into this environment that wasn't made for us, right? And so what happens here is we lose, we lose part of ourselves. We lose part of our wholeness, our authenticity and our identity in an effort to survive in a space. Now, admittedly, this was my experience as a woman in engineering. Um, and I didn't realize it until I left engineering and began to think on and reflect on all the ways that I was so determined to fit in, all the things that I did, all the things that I began to do as a function of trying to fit in with my team, right? And, and that's what I want you to think about. What are all of those things that maybe you even love now, but you, you tell yourself that you love them because that's what your team loves and that's how you talk to your team, right? Um, for, for my team, I, I never watched TV, believe it or not, until I worked in industry. I had to start watching TV so I could talk about the office with them. I had to watch football so I could talk about Texas football with them. I never cursed before I was on my engineering team and now I can't, I can't stop, right? But, and so maybe that one stuck. But I can do without football. I can do without the, well, I still watch lots of TV now, but right, we, we change to try to fit into these environments, right? But what we want to think about is structural belonging. How do we change the environment so that people can show up as their authentic selves, that we function from an asset driven mindset so that people can show up and we honor all parts of who they are, all parts of how they contribute as a value add to the space rather than saying, hey, that's not how we function here. You can try to fit in, but don't expect us to change anything, right? If we want to create structural belonging, we have to build our environments, build our cultures for people, right? We can't just say, hey, come in, see if you can fit in. We need to change the way that we operate. Um, just released a couple of days ago, I did a podcast interview with um, a group out of Europe, actually, the Sour, they're a design studio. And so you can listen to this podcast. I'm going to drop the link in the chat here. Um, and I talk about how to build structural belonging for inclusive environments. Um, and so check that out if you're interested. Now, why we care about belonging is because it is a fundamental part of our human need. Now, we many of us are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then the sort of the base level here is we've got to take care of our physiological and our needs and our safety needs, right? So that's making sure that we have our air, food, water, shelter. Um, we've got safety needs, thinking about are we secure? Do we have health? Do we have you know some uh, resources to sort of function? But right in the middle is this human need to have love and belonging. That's our friendship, intimacy, family, a sense of connection. And this happens before our esteem and our self-actualization. So what this means is, is we have to experience a sense of belonging in order to get anything done. We have to be able to experience these things. And so belonging and feeling valued are fundamental human needs and people need to perceive that they are a valued member of a team and experience treatment that satisfies their needs for belongingness and uniqueness in the workplace. And so inclusive leadership helps to address these two crucial needs and it enhances performance, collaboration, attendance, 
um, and reduces turnover. So like these are all good things here. And you can read a Harvard Business Review article on why inclusive leadership is good here. And so uh, why it's good for organizations. You can also read an article that I wrote with my colleagues, Dr. James Hawley Jr. and Dr. Dr. Pamela Legette Robison um, in the book by Kendall. She's here, uh, not Kendall, uh, Meg, Meg Kendall here. She's um, here with us, I think. Um, and, Ro and Cindy, I don't know if y'all are here, but they were the editors for this book. And so you can check this out and, and learn more about it and you can download it. It is open source. And so you can uh, check it out from the resource page as well. So with all that being said, how do we become an inclusive leader? And so there are two kind of frameworks I'm gonna introduce you today that sort of work together in a matrix. And so this is the inclusive leadership development model. And so if you read that book chapter that I just showed, it will tell you kind of how we got there and uh, how we got to this inclusive leadership development model. Um, you can also learn some of the history and the, the ways in which this was mapped out. But for those of you who are from engineering audiences, I actually looked at engineering ABET standards. I looked at pre-college engineering habits of mind pull together inclusive leader frameworks and then created this model. So if there's ever a question of like, this doesn't fit in our curriculum, I made a whole case for it. So you can read that book chapter and take it to your leaders and say, this is part of our curriculum. So check that out. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is the inclusive leadership reflection tool with a strengths-based continuum. And so this strengths-based continuum is gonna allow you an opportunity to kind of reflect on your own sort of situation and your own sort of where you are in this continuum. And it is a strengths-based and asset-based continuum. It's not meant to be punitive. It is meant to say, here I am and here I want to grow. Um, it's based on sort of a growth mindset. So to get us started, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes and I want you to take the quiz. Um, quiz is a bit of a misnomer, um, but it takes all of the different components of inclusive leadership and you look at where you might fall along the continuum. So I'm going to give you a few minutes, um, take the quiz so you can go to 70v.co slash leader, do the QR code. It should take just a couple of minutes to answer these few questions. So let's do a little bit of activity. All right, so dive in, check that out. All right, let's come back together. If you're still poking away at responses, that's fine, keep going. Um, but I'm gonna introduce you here quickly to the first, to the, to the stages of the growth continuum. And uh, so again, you can learn more about this and your handout, all the explanations here are, are on your handout as well. So the first part, part of the growth continuum is that you are aware that you are at a moment where you recognize that you have an opportunity to learn and you an opportunity to learn and begin to practice those knowledge and skills. The next part of the continuum is that of a novice. At this point, you are demonstrating beginning knowledge and skills, however, with a very limited use of the defined practice. The next part of the growth continuum is a moment where you are committed. Here you commit to and you expand your knowledge and skills, but your performance is inconsistent. Now, again, as we go into this next one, I want to acknowledge that you could be multiple things, right? Now, the quiz had you select the best one that you sort of felt like you fit in, but you could be inconsistent and still teaching this stuff to others like me, right? So I may be inconsistent at, at my inclusive leadership practices at times because I'm still developing that. I'm still 100% committed, but you can also begin teaching that. So the next part of this is that of proficient. You are applying those knowledge and skills consistently and thoroughly in a recognizable way. That means other people see it too. The next to last is that of an exemplar. You are sustaining an exemplary level of practice and you intentionally model this element for others. And then the final part of the, con of the continuum is that of a reformer. You are stimulating and facilitating institutional change, improving system-wide outcomes for marginalized and traditionally minoritized individuals. So again, this is the full continuum for the reflection tool. Now we're gonna dive into each of the components and it starts with us, right? So again, this model is iterative. There's a no point in which you say, I've got myself figured out, now I can move on. <laughs> it is, you're doing all the things, you know, all at once and continuing to learn and grow as you move through them. So first, an inclusive leader 
understands those social and political contexts that creates their identity and how it influences and biases their perception of the world. And when we think about how we begin to understand our social and political context, we have to begin to think about positionality. And so this term was certainly popularized through qualitative research, but it's gaining lots of popularity now. Um, if you read the Journal of Engineering Education, if you've done some of our other events through ASWE and read some other conference papers, some of our colleagues, Stephen uh, Seculas has written and his team has written on positionality. He's got a great paper I encourage you to read. Um, and I've got an exercise that you can do to begin to think about what is your positionality. But your positionality, it describes how your identity biases your understanding of an outlook on the world. It also begins to think about sort of what's salient at different times, right? If you were in an environment full of people who were maybe like some part of your identity, um, maybe it's a marginalized identity, it may not be salient at that point. But then if I show up and I'm the only female in a class full of 70 engineering students, at that moment, my gender becomes a salient part of my identity as a marginalized and tra traditionally excluded person in that space. So to think about positionality, we have to begin to think about how we sort of move through the world. Now, what this does not look like, and I've got a couple of examples here. And so a couple of examples with this to be to think about um, you know, when we say things like, I'm just here to do a job, or I'm tired of being politically correct. Or when we say things like, and I was guilty of this for a long time, growing up in the dominant culture as a white person thinking I don't have culture. I thought culture was assigned to people who were not like me with my color skin tone, right? When we don't acknowledge that we have culture, that we don't acknowledge that we have identities, or when we say things like, I'm not biased, right? When we use this kind of language, this is not what this looks like. And so um, I've also had lots of engineering people say like, there's no bias in engineering. We're just teaching circuits. We're just teaching thermodynamics, whatever it is. Well, folks, there is lots of bias in all of these things. It's in the environment. It's in how the books are written. It's in how we teach. It's in the strategies that we use to teach and the strategies that we use to grade. It is embedded in all of these things and how we have been conditioned to move through the world influences those things, right? So part of our individuality is thinking about, you know, what are sort of my ways of knowing and doing and how am I pushing those on the classroom? How am I pushing those on my team and not considering other ways of knowing and doing? And so some planning prompts that you can do here is to begin thinking about in what ways are we as a team, how are we collectively encouraging each other to reflect on our identities? How are we inviting dialogue that expands our social consciousness and explains how our identities bias our perceptions and outlooks on the world, right? So this sort of individual state, this is looking in. It's doing lots of work to understand who you are, your lived experience, and how it affects how you function, how you move through the world. That's a function of where you grew up. It's a function of the kind of television that you've watched. It's a function of your family culture. It's a function of your race, your gender, your class, and how all of those things shape how you see the world. So some strategies that you can do here, and again, all of these things are accessible on my website, is to one, examine your positionality. And you can do an exercise to begin to think about that. And this is an ongoing practice. Again, it's not a, po a point in which I can say, I know who I am, right? I'm always learning who I am and learning how my background affects how I move through the world. Next, you can incorporate activities in your, into your day where you're explicitly asking yourself, how does my gender, my race, my ability, or any other intersection of my identity, how might it be an ad advantage or a disadvantage in some situation or collaboration. Another thing to ask is like, how am I showing up in this space? Am I showing up in a space that is, that I am unintentionally maybe putting my, an identity that has some power up on a pedestal? Am I showing up in a way that's elevating others? Again, it's that reflection, active reflection. Another thing that you can do, and this was something that came up in your feedback on what is an inclusive leader, but it's creating a culture of feedback on your team that holds space 
for helping each other to learn to see and examine blind spots. So this is creating an environment where it's okay to say, hey, you know, this might be a blind spot for you. Can we talk about this? Or, hey, would you be willing to kind of look into this? And then not getting deflected, you know, deflect and, and defensive about that kind of feedback, right? We have to create a culture of feedback that allows that. Um, and then certainly you could read that article, the Harvard Business Review article that I shared as well, and reflect on how you might be able to improve and become a more inclusive leader. So I want you to take a minute to reflect. I want you, you've rated yourself on the, um, when you did the quiz, I want you to take some notes of some evidence that supports where you sort of fit on that continuum. And then I want you to set some goals. So I'm going to leave the screen up for just a minute to allow you to reflect. And then I'm going to invite you to share a goal on a Slido. So just take a minute to sort of note evidence of sort of where you fit on this continuum. And then think of a goal that you want to set, maybe one of those actions, maybe one of those strategies. So share a goal that you want to set for yourself related to this first component of the model around individuality and you as an individual. How do we look in? What's a goal that you want to set for yourself, maybe set for your team and how you lead your team or how you lead your class? Set a goal. All right, got a couple of contributions so far. So somebody wants to reflect daily on how you show up in your team interactions. And this, even though I have another part of the model that's called practices, this is also a practice, right? To become an inclusive leader, we have to practice these skills over and over again. Um, so work on impact beyond your sphere of influence towards systemic change. Excellent, acknowledge what's going on better. So that's about paying attention. It's about listening, right? Uh, check in with colleagues to see how you're perceived. Uh, there's a great book that I love by uh, Dr. Tasha Yurik. It's called Insight. Um, I can, uh, it's called Insight. She, she, I think she changed the subtitle. It's, it's like why we're not as self-aware as we think we are. Um, but if you look up Insight on Amazon, it's there. It's a great book on building self-awareness as well. And I also have some resources on my website on like building self-awareness for social justice. Um, let's see, leading and support your, where did it go? Lead and support the campus community to accomplish belonging, inclusion and diversity initiatives, ensure the language that you're using is inclusive of all, bringing inclusive discussions to your class where everyone can participate, can participate, creating a culture promoter, awesome. Be actively aware and reflect and reflect, share this information, excellent. All right, well done. Um, we um, are going to move forward talking about lens um, and we got a couple of notices on sphere of influence. So I'll make sure to I have a sphere of influence activity. Um, I need to take notes of all these things I'm saying I need to add. All right. Develop a culture of feedback and reflection. Awesome. So we're going to move forward to the next part. Um, the next part of the model and that is the lens and so lens has two components systemic thinking and then this ethical dilemma of bias and so what you know the, the first part is to be a systemic thinker or let me back up so lens is how we look at and see the world right so individual is really looking in and then we begin to look out. And so there's two key things here. First is systemic thinking, and the second is this ethical dilemma of bias. And so systemic thinking here, this is an inclusive leader considers how systems of oppression and advantage influence their decisions and impact their team. And so this is again, something that many of us have been conditioned to not see. We've been conditioned to not understand. And that's particularly easy if the system was built for you, right? If the system was built for you, you're not experiencing the barriers that other people face. Now, this is outside the scope of what we can accomplish today, but I've got this image. If you want to learn more about the four eyes of oppression, thinking about ideological, interpersonal, institutional, and internalized, I encourage you to dig into some of the resources on my website. Um, but again, we have to begin to think systemically. 
And the next key part here is this ethical dilemma of bias. And so an inclusive leader investigates how interpersonal and institutionalized bias produces an ethical dilemma that we must address, right? So just acknowledging that bias exists and then not doing anything means that we aren't looking at it systemically and then, then we are complicit in those systems, right? And so for, for this part, what the lens does not look like are saying things like women just aren't interested in tech careers, right? When we say things like that, we aren't understanding the systemic ways in which women have been excluded from tech careers, right? We're not looking at the ways that maybe we have interpersonal reactions that continue to marginalize and exclude women from tech careers. We're not looking at the ways in which some women have internalized these ideologies and continue to affect them. And so from a systemic thinking standpoint, we have to acknowledge that we have to address systems of oppression at all four levels to begin to reduce those barriers. Saying things like they just, they, right? That's usually problematic language. They just don't succeed in that type of role. Or saying language like they just didn't ask for more, right? And so that's how the pay gap, for example, is perpetuated. And so some planning prompts that you can employ would be thinking about how can we use root cause analysis that's systems thinking if you ever use six sigma if you ever use you know kanban if you any you know, lots of different kinds and ways of of problem solving you can use lots of root cause analyses tools and i've got lots of free tools on my website to help you as well to reveal the inequities that our marginalized people are facing and to help us understand what they're experiencing so that usually means we got to ask them right Second is thinking about how are we considering those institutional barriers that marginalized and minoritized people face in the workplace and actively working to remove those obstacles and supplant them with support. And then finally, in what ways are we establishing guardrails that attempt to protect us from biased decisions, policies, and practices? Um, another way of thinking about this is, is thinking about the term nudges. And so I've got a couple of book references on the web page that I'm certain that are there. Thinking about what are those sort of nudges that we can put into place that help us change our behaviors. So an example of a nudge would be how many of you set your alarm, but it is not on your nightstand. So you have to like get out of bed to turn off your alarm, right? That's changing an environment that nudges your behavior that says, hey, don't turn off the alarm, right? Like you take a little bit of extra work. So that's an example of a guardrail, a nudge to change behavior. So in what ways are you as a leader, as an educator, as a manager, putting up guardrails, tools and strategies that help you to reduce the ways in which decisions, policies and practices may be reinforcing systems of oppression? So examples, strategies that you can do is we want to always ensure that we use diverse people, stories, and way of knowing and doing. Um, we want to push ourselves to think about issues systemically. This is particularly important because so often when, when things, um, things get reduced around diversity, equity, and inclusion work to the interpersonal, where people say things like, well, I'm not racist, or I'm not biased, or I'm not this, you know, I treat everyone the same. In those instances, they're being reduced to an interpersonal kind of interaction. We aren't looking at the ways in which this is affecting the system and which way we may be complicit in the system's functioning, right? How are we upholding that system? So we wanna make sure that we are pushing people to think about issues systemically. Are we using root cause analysis as a tool to understand issues of inequity? Are we ensuring that the ethical dilemma of bias is part of all ethics discussions, right? How are we examining these things? So now I'm going to give you a chance to reflect. So the same as last time, I want you to start to note some evidence of how you were employing systems thinking and this ethical dilemma of bias. So what's some evidence? And then I'm going to get you to share in just a minute some goals for growth. What's some evidence of you building a practice of systems thinking, acknowledging this ethical dilemma of bias, 
and get ready to share a goal for growth. So remind of the lens is the systemic thinking and this ethical dilemma of bias. What are some goals for growth here? How are you going to build a more systemic thinking and address the ethical dilemma of bias? So more effectively use the self other systems model of leadership. Hey, whoever that is, tell us more. I want to learn more about that. Add a link to the chat. We'd love to learn more. Identify biases in a workplace that are invisible to participants. Consider other points of view. Try to understand their stories. Recognize your own biases and owning them, seeing which one I can start working on. Yeah, remind self and others of root causes and create nudge questions to broaden perspectives. Excellent. Uh, so to that point, I have on my website um, a couple of tools. So here are some unbiasing nudges. Um, and so you can access this. Let me see if I can pop up this PDF really fast. So this PDF on this sort of unbiasing nudges, these are small behaviors that you can employ. So this is something you can download this PDF and like print it out, make it a poster. Uh, it can be a way of sort of checking in with each other as well. If you want to try to help others think about their own biases, we all have them absolutely. Walk in others' shoes, push the admin to consider the impact of decisions that are inequitable. Um, challenge employees who may think, make things personal and push them to look at the system. And I will say this is a very challenging thing to do for people from dominant cultures, because people from dominant cultures, like white people, people who have benefited from the system, don't see the inequities in the system naturally, right? So it is a growth process to help people begin to see that. And that, again, is a practice. Um, so reframe thinking and actively seeking perspectives that are different from your own, acknowledging bias and peer review and tenure review and all of these things right and how we grade and how students grade it's in all of the all of the things yeah excellent reminder that our discomfort is not a priority yeah okay excellent okay so let's dive forward and look at practices so practices has two key elements that of human-centered approach and being an accountable like lifelong learner um so i see the Tracy, the, so that inclusive nudges resource is on the website, so you can download it here. I haven't wrote, built a web page for it yet, but it is, I've got a cognitive biases tool and then the unbiasing nudges. So that's on the, the link that you can download. So 70v.co slash leader. Okay. So the practices has two elements, that of human-centered approach and being a lifelong learner. So let's talk about the first one. So in the human-centered approach is when an inclusive leader is working from an asset or a strengths-based mindset and recognizing the value and celebrating the beauty of diversity. They lead intentionally with empathy, curiosity, and open-mindedness to strengthen the dignity of all humans around us. Um, if the term asset mindset is new to you, I encourage you to look it up. It's something that's really gaining a lot of um, you know, space and, and our work. And I will also admit that there is there are a dearth of resources. So if you are looking for something to, to publish on, this is it, folks, because everybody keeps talking about it, but there's not a lot of great resources on it. Um, but it actually comes from the psychology around strengths based approach and so it's looking at how do we build on people's strengths, how do we acknowledge the value that they add instead of looking at someone and saying they aren't doing this they aren't they lack this saying what is this person bringing to the space, rather than what did they lack what's the deficit mindset. Um, and the next key component of this is that of an accountable lifelong learner. And so here you are reflecting on your personal and institutional actions and you're committed to learning more about what you don't know, including other ways of knowing and doing. Uh, I know for me, one of the things that was one of the most powerful things I learned uh, many years ago was learning about sort of individualistic versus collectivist ways of knowing and doing. 
And when I look at how my sort of mode of operation as, you know, a white woman growing up in a very, you know, rural kind of community, um, I sort of operate by like all individualistic characteristics. And when I realize that that is the sort of dominant way of knowing and doing in our country and how that was showing up for me as an educator and everything I was doing was like a competition. Everything was about what is it that you do rather than looking at the whole one. I realized like, wow, I want to be a collectivist. And so like I actively worked to that, but I know that my brain's not wired to that. And so I have to put a lot of practice to, to perform in that and, and be in that kind of way. But I also want to bring in collectivist ways of knowing and doing and honor those in how I teach and honor those in how I lead. Right. And so thinking about that is another approach for you. The second key part of this is you are personally accountable for the mistakes, the failures and the mishaps because you're going to make them rather than deflecting, avoiding responsibility and claiming good intent. No person from a marginalized group cares that you had good intentions, right? When they've experienced microaggression, when they've experienced discrimination, when they've experienced some disadvantage, you don't need to tell them that you had good intent, right? That, that's not gonna fix that for them. Hear what they're gifting you with and say, wow, thank you for this feedback. I'm gonna do something about this. I'm gonna learn more. I wanna begin to address this issue, right? So being accountable, again, takes practice. Um, so let's look at what this does not look like. It's saying things like, hey, that's not how we do it, or that's not what we meant, or saying things like, don't be so sensitive. This is not what that these practices look like. So some prompts that you can employ. Uh, so, hey, folks, for those of y'all who are having to jump off, I'm so glad that you came. Um, I have your emails from the registration list, and we'll send some follow up. So thanks for joining us. So back to the planning prompts Some prompts that you can use are thinking about how are we shifting mindsets to value and elevate different ways of knowing and doing. How are we celebrating differences rather than suggesting people hide and avoid them and this particular one is in deep contrast with a big movement of like don't talk about differences don't talk about race don't talk about gender because that somehow divides us folks it doesn't right when we talk about who we are and our identity and we talk about them in an authentic way that is a way to celebrate the beauty of diversity it's a way to increase our own understanding of the experiences of other people and then finally, how are we practicing visible accountability for mistakes, failures, and mishaps? And so visible accountability means how are we demonstrating that publicly so that people say, hey, we are learning from and we are all growing in this. Some strategies that you can employ on your team, in your classroom, um, or in your company is to think about how do we incorporate activities that encourage curiosity and respect of other ways of knowing and doing how do we challenge people to creatively solve for equitable and inclusive solutions? How do we expand? Um, there, there's a tool that's also linked in some of the resources called the expanding engineering limits concept that um, I'm forgetting the citation for that, but that engages people in deeper learning about ways and understanding of gender and other diversities within engineering culture, how that could improve engineering practices and outcomes. And then finally, emphasize empathy and accountability as a crucial skill for your team culture. So this is, you know, what we evaluate is what we think is important. Um, in the book chapter that my colleagues and I wrote, we talk a lot about the sort of hidden culture, the hidden curriculum, the null curricula. What we don't evaluate is saying we don't care about it implicitly or explicitly. And so if we think that empathy, accountability, inclusive collaboration is important, how are we monitoring that and evaluating that? So same drill, we're gonna give you a chance to reflect on this. I want you to note some evidence of your progress in this, and then we're gonna get you to share some goals for success here. Set some goals. Give you another minute to reflect. All right, if you've got a goal around the practices of um, a human centered approach or accountable lifelong learner share those here. So becoming an accountable lifelong learner doesn't mean to go ask your one black friend about all experiences about black people. 
that's not what that means. It means read some books, follow some people on Twitter, watch some movies and documentaries, <laughs> do your own research. Don't ask people to represent their entire race, gender, or ethnicity. Um, you can certainly ask them their experience and stories if you are comfortable, if, if you have a relationship with them, um, but be thoughtful to not ask them to represent all people. So this is the first one here, being unapologetic about championing DEI, but at the same time making it clear that mistakes will happen, absolutely. Reinport, reinforcing the importance of measurement for EDI matters, convert uh, current climate evaluation, covert current climate evaluation to be more asset-based. I think I think you mean convert. Um, owning your mistakes. Somebody gifted me with this way of thinking years ago when I was on sort of my beginning journey of self-awareness and social consciousness expansion. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to go apologize to everyone I've ever met for these things, right? And she's like, pump the brakes, Megan. First of all, I just want you to celebrate when you begin to notice things, right? You'll get better and faster at noticing the ways in which you can sort of engage with others. But really first, just celebrate that, right? Rather than taking on any kind of shame or any kind of um, you know, you know, guilt associated with that, just celebrate that you're beginning to recognize. And then if you want to, you know, work on amends, you can do that as well. But celebrate when you begin to see these things. Learn not to become defensive if I make a mistake. So a tool for that is to take a deep breath. Wow, thank you for that feedback and mean it sincerely, right? And say, I wanna work on that, right? Just take a deep breath, say thank you for the feedback and express intent that you wanna work on it. Leverage the feedback to be better the future. Read, listen, watch the podcast articles, videos related to EDI each week. Awesome. Excellent examples here. Thank you all so much. And I'm gonna take all of the goals that you all share and I'll post them on the website too. So you're gonna have everyone else's goals that you can see uh, and maybe you can adopt them as, as goals as well. So let's drive forward to the last part of the model. And so that'll, we'll get through this and then that's gonna give us a little bit of time to go into breakout rooms for those who, who have time today. So outcomes again has two parts, culturally intelligent communication and inclusive collaboration. So first of all, cultural intelligent communication means an inclusive leader, as an inclusive leader, you are attentive to which voices, values, ways of knowing and doing are present, missing, or silenced. I'm going to think about that for a second. Whose voices, values, and ways of knowing and doing are present, missing, or silenced? You are also actively and empathically listening and searching for cues to bridge gaps among diverse people. We'll talk a little bit more, get a little bit deeper in this in a second. And inclusive collaboration, this means as an inclusive leader, you are actively and equitably engaging diverse perspectives, experiences, and backgrounds to enrich the collectively shared environment and you are balancing the assumed norms to allow for more authentic engagement. So balancing the assumed norms, meaning that we're paying attention to the, the ways of knowing and doing and saying, what are the norms that have been created in this team? And if they are elevating, highlighting, perpetuating dominant ways of knowing and doing, if we begin to balance that so that it incorporates other ways of knowing and doing from non-dominant cultures, we begin to allow people to show up in a more authentic way. So what this doesn't look like is, to, and I want you to raise your hand if this has happened to you, um, someone repeats or rephrases what you said um, and gets credit for it. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, right? Uh, that usually happens by someone who has some kind of marginalized identity, uh, but if someone else says it or repeats it, they get the credit for it. Uh, so how you fix that is say, hey, hey, let's acknowledge that Christina said this first, right? <laughs> um, and Christina, would you like to elaborate more on your idea, right? So that's some advocacy that you can that you can do there. Another thing that this does not look like is saying, you know, hey, they didn't say anything, so they must be fine. If we go back and use systemic thinking, what are the some of systemic barriers that keep people from saying something, right? Lots of power structures 
how often is someone going to say that something has happened if it's going to influence their outcomes right if it's going to influence their grade their performance review so we can't just say they didn't say anything so they must be fine they always go along with what we usually do so it's not a big deal to operate as we always have this is perpetuating the dominant ways of knowing and doing and is not being in inclusive of other values and practices and you might find that when you incorporate other practices it's better and people like it more, right? So you never know those things until you try. Other language that can be added to this is using language like, hey, that's not very professional, right? I want you to think about who decided what's professional. Where does that history of professionalism come from? Um, or language that's like, you are so articulate, that's usually said to a person of color or someone who is where English is not their first language, right? that these kinds of of language right they are perpetuating those sort of normative behaviors they do not create inclusive environments those are a couple of examples of like really direct microaggressions that could be subtle or not subtle right but when we think about these kinds of things how are we perpetuating examples of of systems that were not created to be inclusive right so a couple of planning prompts that you can employ here are, first of all, in what ways are we actively listening to marginalized voices and in striving to incorporate their ideas? You know, the movement that, you know, for us, by us, right? Like, how are we looking to the people for whom we're trying to serve and incorporating their voices and their ideas and how to serve them? Um, how are we evaluating and refreshing our team norms so that more people authentically engage? So if you find on your team um, that everybody's always talking about football, how do we incorporate other hobbies in there, right? And make say, it doesn't mean everybody has to do those hobbies, but it's just saying, how do we learn something about someone else and create space? If, if all of your social gatherings are at the bar, um, and there's alcohol involved, how do you create a more inclusive option that allows more people to participate, right? How are you, again, evaluating those team norms so that more people can, all gain, can engage? Uh, Peggy added in the chat a uh, another something that maybe she's heard is like, you don't sound like others, right? Exactly, thank you for that. Okay, so let's look at some strategies that you can employ. We're gonna reflect and then we're gonna go into breakout rooms, okay? So first thing that you can do is to ensure that culturally intelligent communication and inclusive collaboration are metrics for evaluations. That which we value is that which we, that, that which we evaluate is that which we value, right? So put the things that, you, that matter to you and how you're evaluating others. Prompt regularly whose voices are either missing or silenced why what can we do what will we do right this is again a practice whose voices silence or missed ascertain ways to measure shifts away from dominant cultures and then finally this is a key two-parter is host small group listening sessions but this only matters if you listen, right? So don't host a listening session if you're not planning to do something with that, if you're not in, in planning to incorporate those voices and that feedback in something. So ask great questions, don't forget to listen and then t take a collective grounded action uh, approach on what, you, on what you've learned from that. So last sort of reflection here, take some notes on some evidence and set some goals for how you wanna move forward. All right, set a goal, set a goal for yourself related to outcomes, culturally intelligent communication and inclusive collaboration. While you're thinking on this, I have to add, you know, the notion of listening. How many of you have ever taken a class on listening? Not many of us, right? What is one of the most important skills in life? listening right so um, I have a lot of resources on my website on listening if you're interested in kind of learning more about how to be a better listener not that I employ them all the time but we can keep learning right all right so let's set a few goals for success here 
related to outcomes. I'm gonna see what you all want to take move forward. And hopefully you've written these down for yourself. Uh, so you're gonna leave with four key goals. Think about people's reactions before you do something that might affect them. Um, I, I love this, the saying, you know, moving away from the golden rule, which is do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, to do unto others as they'd have them do unto them, right? So instead of treating people how you want to treat, be treated, treat people how they want to be treated. Um, and so I'll also add the platinum rule uh, video and resources on my website to, the, to your page. Identify and redirect statements that perpetuate non-inclusion. Learn about hosting listening sessions to better serve underrepresented genders and engineering. Excellent, let's get one more and then we're gonna uh, jump forward to the conclusion here. Allow space for others on the team to contribute their ideas and group sessions, add culturally intelligent communication and inclusive collaboration as metrics, yes. That's excellent. Start by listening, then speak up in ways that acknowledge the listener, respond to people, try not to react. If I cannot create a space that is psychologically safe, then I will ask for anonymous perspectives and contributions. Excellent. Thank you for those contributions. So now we've made it through the seven components of this four part model. Again, this is iterative. We're doing all the things and we're moving through um, as we continue to grow. I want to check and see if anybody set. Um, OK, those weren't questions. Those were some responses. So remember, that you've got all the resources here. I'm going to do one. This is the reflection that I want you to uh, to take into your breakout rooms. Now we're going to set the breakout rooms for I think we can do maybe like um, maybe like how many minutes do you need at the end, Christina? I just need two minutes. That's it. Okay. But I can do breakout rooms with three to four people or okay. what would you like? Put them, um, yeah, like put them like groups of four, um, like four, something like that. And I want you to reflect on and share in the group three things that you learned, two things that you want to do differently, and one immediate action item. And then we're going to share those action items when you come back in a chat storm. Um, but again, if, if you're dropping off because you don't want to do, um, because you don't want to do a breakout room, I get it, it happens. Um, Christina is going to send an evaluation. I also have an evaluation. I also um, offer certificates for participation in this. Uh, so you can do that as well. Um, you can also join my mailing list if you're interested. And so once Christina gets those breakout rooms open, I want you to, all right, you can go ahead and open them. Um, this, and I'll share the screen with you so you'll be able to, to have that. How much time do you want to give them? Let's get start with, uh, let's start with eight minutes. All right, welcome back, everyone. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little it chat, recorded. a little chat storm. A little chat storm. So we're going to do a little chat storm. So what a chat storm is, it's a way for everyone to contribute ideas all at once. And so this way, everyone sort of gets a voice um, and they aren't biased or deferred by what others say. And so how you do it is you offer a prompt and the prompt is what's your one action item. I'm um, going to give you a minute or so to respond um, and reflect and prepare your answer in the chat. You're going to do it on the Slido, but don't hit submit. Um, but because we're using Slido, I can time that. And then we'll be able to see your action items. So while y'all are adding in your action items, I want to open up the floor for questions. I realize we didn't get um, a lot of opportunity to ask questions. So um, while y'all are contributing to the action item, what's on your mind? What questions? Maybe a big takeaway that you had from your small group discussion. You should be able to unmute and share with us. Or you could type a question in the chat as well. Well, one thing that um, I said, and everyone seemed to agree with it, is that uh, and I've it has never been an issue with me, but I'm going to be doing it even more. I'm not an issue with me because I'm usually very vocal. But when I see um, um, that um, someone is not being inclusive is is violating that social or that psychological safe space for somebody else to call them on it to you know in a respectful manner, but to tell them um, you know are are you aware that this that you did this that you said this that your body language conveyed something that 
that made the other person or me uncomfortable. And if it's intentional, well, let, let's talk about <laughs> the damage. And if it's not, are you, you know, you should be made aware that, that it had that result. And, and so perhaps awareness and um, that self-check would be good. And another thing is that I, I'm, I'm just as guilty as the next person that it's unintentional, but I might say something or do something that might um, have that impact and apologize, immediately apologize, acknowledge and keep myself in check. Thank you, Jenna. I appreciate that. What else? Questions, maybe takeaways from your group. All right, well, it looks like we've got um, only four people contributed. We've got one more person typing. If, again, you could add your action in the chat. Um, oh no, this is done wrong. Um, I'm so sorry I did it wrong. So it should have been not a word cloud. That's a, that's a mistake. Um, so hopefully plan to introduce this model to leadership, be more consistent, share something, <laughs> practice accountability, ask questions of others. Um, it looks like we got a little jumble here, so. I'm sorry I messed that up, but um, hopefully you are leaving today with some excellent takeaways, uh, some goals, some uh, some action items that you want to take. Um, I want to encourage you to to check out the website. This again kind of gives you a, an example of things that sort of you can sort of move through this ways that you can continue the conversation with your colleagues, with um, people around you. Um, I've got lots of free resources on my website that I hope that you'll uh, be able to, to use in your work. And um, again, I'm so grateful that you chose to be here today. Um, your feedback is important to me. So whether you share your feedback um, with, with me or if you share it through the CDEI um, list, I, I want to know how I can improve. It helps me better serve other people. Um, and it helps me increase blind spots if you if you spotted any for me as well. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Christina. And again, Christina and the CDEI virtual workshop team, thank you so much for hosting this. And I'm so glad that you all came today. Bye, y'all.